the surface of a star. En route, it passes through exoplanet atmospheres, and it ultimately ends up striking at the origins of life itself. Today's speaker is the Phillips Professor of Astronomy at Harvard University. He serves as the director of the Harvard Origins of Life Initiative and the co-director of the Simons Collaboration on the Origins of Life. In preparing my introduction, I learned for the first time that in preparing for his career in astrophysics, he earned not one but two PhDs, the first in physics and the second in astronomy. He's been thinking for a very long time about the possibilities of clement conditions and conditions for life on other planets. And if you'd like to catch up on some of his thinking, I'd encourage you to read his book, The Life of Super-Earths, or to watch one of his several TED Talks. But for now, I'd like to call Dimitar Saslov up to the stage and tell us about stellar UV light and the origins of life. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for that very generous introduction. And uh, uh, um, I just want to start by saying it's really great to give the colloquium again. Uh, since I haven't been on this stage uh, for uh, since last century. Uh, <laughs> and back then, I think it was more of a job talk. Well, th this one may turn out to be a job talk too, if I lose mine <laughs> in the process. But uh, uh, um, it is uh, a great pleasure to um, prepare this talk just for you. So you're also the guinea pigs for it. It's the first time I'm giving it out. And uh, the title itself combines um, what I know in astronomy and astrophysics and some planetary science, which is stellar UV light and its uh, attenuation in gases, like in the atmosphere of a planet, with my uh, nearly complete uh, uh, lack of knowledge in the second part of the title, uh, which involves a lot of chemistry, um, or essentially is chemistry. And for that reason, since there are a few uh, colleagues here who are chemists, I have brought some uh, earplugs for them <laughs> and eye shades. Any takers? Uh, because they will be appalled and I don't want them to, to be so. So be, be gentle, please. So I'll try to tell the story the way I understand it or don't, which is basically uh, without using much chemical terminology, although I have to do some, and that's why I brought some props and my idiot's guide to organic chemistry. <laughs> so um, we'll try to get through that. But basically, what I want to say is that, yes, um, as Dave said, more than 10 years ago now, I got really interested in this issue of the origin of life. And what I mean by the origins of life, and plural is important here, is that uh, I become, became interested and very interested in the transition from chemistry to protocells. And uh, what is, um, I will be referring to this chemistry as prebiotic chemistry, essentially, um, uh, um, naturally occurring geochemistry before there was life on the planet, early Earth in this particular case. And I'll refer to protocells as the chemical system that we hope one day to create in the lab, uh, which can essentially do something very simple, which is this. It has a um, um, complex molecule, but not too complex, which uh, our best bet for it right now is RNA, the uh, RNA from existing life, um, our own RNA, and uh, in a vesicle or in a cell, um, mostly likely made of some kind of lipid bilayer, which can uh, copy itself uh, uh, successfully, catalyze its own replication, which we call non-enzymatic self-templating um, or self-replication, and perform some kind of biological function or biochemical function, for example, support the growth or the sustain, sustaining of that lipid bilayer, which identifies it as a cell. That uh, general framework um, goes back uh, quite a few years, 
at least until 1986, when it was su su suggested as under the name of the RNA world hypothesis by Harold's own um, uh, Wally Gilbert here. And so um, it con continues to be um, the way many people think and pursue understanding the origins of life or that transition from chemistry to life. And um, in that transition, um, philosophically, uh, there are really um, two major approaches nowadays and for a long time to origins of life. Uh, one uh, which starts with the uh, me mechanochemical machines, uh, uh, let's say metabolic cycles first, and the other which really starts with the, an energized assemblage of building blocks the building blocks which would make this system that you see here. And that's more along the lines of the RNA world hypothesis, which uh, essentially is that uh, somehow chemistry led to RNA, which could copy itself without proteins or with very few proteins participating. And then all the uh, complex machinery leading to DNA and proteins and enzymes came as a result that initial evolution in the protocells themselves. Um, so then the issue of origin of life becomes uh, more of how do we get to those building blocks? How do we um, build them? So basically, um, uh, without going into many details, I want to tell you that I uh, have chosen to work in the building blocks uh, philosophical framework after for a couple of years considering both approaches. And uh, this is what I'm going to kind of explain and tell you uh, about this project today. And uh, a lot of this project um, has to do with understanding misconceptions, which uh, mostly are my misconceptions, but sometimes uh, very broad. And there is one particular one with which I want to start today uh, because it's quite um, related to astrophysics. and. Um, it's quite pervasive. And that's the misconception that stellar UV light is really bad for life. Um, it's certainly bad for you, so please use sunscreen. Uh, <laughs> cancer is not a good thing. Um, and it's certainly been known for a long time that UV light kills uh, not just life, but the building blocks of life as well. It just destroys those molecules. But as a blanket statement, it's not very useful. It is certainly true that as far as uh, um, UV light on planets that we're interested in. There is a lot of it, uh, both uh, large planets like the sun, uh, sorry, large stars and small ones uh, produce a lot of it, uh, 10 to the 13 photons per second per square centimeter per nanometer is a lot of UV. But um, the context is very important here. Um, and um, there at least two important things to consider. Number one is really, um, you have to really make your statement uh, what wavelengths are we talking about and what are the ones that are relevant? What fluxes, doses are important? Not just fluxes, but doses, the dosage. And then it really matters what you're trying to do. And this is exactly the point that I want to drive here is we're trying to build those building blocks and the protocells and there are ways in which they can evolve later on to develop the complexity of life we see uh, even in the geological record, but certainly today, uh, to deal um, with the UV light that is harmful. So you have to really understand what is the role of the UV light before you make a blanket statement that it's bad and so we have to find origins of life somewhere where there is no access to sunlight at all. Sunlight or stellar light in principle, which is where we start, of course. And when we talk about uh, UV light, most of it for stars ranging from um, M dwarfs to solar type stars, the sun here, um, really hits you at Lyman Alpha. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, well known and it's uh, very important in the interstellar medium but not on the surfaces of planets, of course. And uh, on the surfaces of planets, you will be cut off both by the atmosphere and certainly by the water, which we already have assumed uh, is important from the very beginning for the origin of life 
at least on our planet. So you know, we can talk a lot about alternative uh, forms of life on uh, very specific environments, but please remember, at least let's solve one problem first, which is uh, what about the life as we know it uh, origin first. So then we are left with this part of the UV spectrum, which is uh, doesn't have a name, but is I call it just mid-range UV which, by the way, uh, is uh, near and dear to me. When I was a, a graduate student in Toronto, I uh, used a lot the magnesium-2 H&K lines, uh, which at the time IUE, uh, the little UV uh, telescope, had detected in Cepheids, and they were varying a lot. They're chromospheric uh, indicators uh, for uh, a lot of stars, including in our sun. But basically, this uh, spectrum is not that interesting from the point of the high energy spectrum that is here, but that's what you get. And you get uh, less of it in M dwarfs, but that's a different question. <clears throat> so basically, um, uh, before even starting this project, the big question was to define, if I'm going to be building a lab, I not want to know what kind of UV equipment to buy. Uh, I wanted to get a tunable UV laser in order to try some of those ideas, uh, but the first point was, well, tunable where? And so the mid-UV was determined from work, which was mostly done uh, as uh, part of the PhD thesis of uh, Sukrit, right here, who is now graduated our department. This is, in, is a Price Fellow at MIT. And that work was to confirm something which was approximately known already, but do a much better job on it and actually understand its geochemical implications, which was the most important contribution he made, that there is a window, which is this yellow window, uh, which was open um, to uh, the surface of the Earth and even at some depth in water reservoirs like lakes, a depth of one meter in this particular case, as you see here. One meter of water is quite a bit, and you still get UV light from 200 nanometers to 300 nanometers, which is uh, not available on the Earth since the Great Oxidation Event 2.3 billion years ago. Nowadays, we all only get this blue part of the UV spectrum, and for the last past two billion years, that's been the case. But before that, and certainly in the prebiotic Earth, uh, uh, we got everything down to 200 nanometers. So um, their main reason why this is so is water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide being, in fact, the most important one of those. Uh, and that's the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere don't need very much to block this part of the UV spectrum, meaning this part of the UV spectrum, 200 and below. And so... Um, there are other gases like sulfur dioxide and uh, hydrogen sulfide who could, that could do something similar, but you need a lot of them. And there is no evidence, even on Mars, where there was a lot more vol volcanism early on, that they were as important as carbon dioxide. So uh, one question which may be not so important for the specific case of the Earth, but is important in general, and actually it will be good uh, to confirm it in some way experimentally, is uh, the proposition that rocky planets end up with uh, carbon dioxide-based atmospheres. Uh, they really would be dominated by nitrogen, but the carbon dioxide is the important one here, particularly for what I'm interested in, in terms of the UV light that reaches the surface or the water aquifers. So basically, that is, was another project which had to be done um, to understand the availability of water and... Uh, carbon dioxide across a large range of planets and geochemistries and geophysics. And uh, that's another really talented student, uh, Laura Schaefer, who just uh, now is going to move as a system professor at Stanford, is uh, uh, the work that uh, essentially is based on this uh, last paper from last year, uh, uh, which is based on several years of experiments that uh, my colleagues uh, the EPS department here uh, did for us and with us uh, at Sandia National Lab of the mixing of silicates and iron and other metals under high pressure. In other words, uh, what here is simply said, 
you know, iron silicates and iron somehow mix and there is a core and this, the state of that mantle here or here or there determines what you end up in the atmosphere and particularly whether you end up with a nitrogen car carbon dioxide atmosphere. So um, theoretically this is and experimentally based on that. This is what we propose but um, it is model dependent. Uh, unlike this, this is much more secure. I mean, it's kind of simple radiative transfer. This involves models, so I would like to see this um, confirmed by exoplanet observations one day, because in our solar system, we don't have enough planets to actually uh, be sure that we can confirm that. But let's move on to the real topic here, which is the origins of life stuff. And uh, let me tell you what my outline for the rest of the talk is. So I really want to show you how UV light uh, uh, not only drives the chemistry that uh, some of us believe uh, leads to the transition to life, but also shapes that chemistry. That is, uh, there are some vestiges in today's life in terms of the building blocks and in terms of some of the basic functionality of uh, those molecules, which are still left from that time. And you can see the connection to UV light and essentially UV light determined that this is going to be the case. And particularly the UV light that is shaped by the planetary conditions that I just described to you. Planetary and stellar. So there is first the synthesis, we'll start with that, then the selectivity, and then what happens as complexity grows, which is actually a very interesting transition from a world of molecular survival to a world of biology, essentially. And in all of these steps, the star and its plants do play a very important role. So uh, when we talk about the prebiotic photochemistry, again, just to um, put it into numbers, that window that Sukrit's uh, uh, thesis uh, determined is from 200 to 3 nanometers, uh, 300 nanometers, is an energy window from six to four electron volts, which happens to be exactly what you need. It just has enough energy to enact those uh, reactions for small molecules, but not too much to break them up, and even to the point of a swart, slightly larger components, the building blocks, which are no longer simple molecules, but still very small, things like this. That energy window is just the right balance for synthesis, stability, and selectivity as I want to convince you. So um, uh, let's start with the photostability issue, which is kind of the simplest thing. Obviously, uh, if you want to create something on the surface of the planet and there is UV light, you have to uh, show uh, to everybody's satisfaction that UV light is not going to destroy it. And so um, to do that, um, let's uh, basically <laughs> Go to the basics. So we have uh, the RNA world, which is uh, essentially a project to create a RNA molecule that will be able to become central to the uh, protocells. And um, we really mean RNA here, like in uh, uh, life today, consisting of its um, building blocks, which then form the polymer. Um, and those building blocks are well known as uh, uh, the uh, uh, sugars which connect the bases to the uh, phosphate group and create the nucleotide which then lines up those nucleotides which then uh, line up in a, a stacked um, uh, backbone based with, on the phosphate groups and eventually um, uh, they can pair like DNA does, but RNA does the same thing. If you have long enough uh, polymer of RNA, it can fold on itself, and it does so quite effectively. In fact, sometimes too much of it. So the building blocks for this are very important, and that was really understood long time ago. And when uh, Stanley Muir and uh, Yuri and Muir uh, did their experiments, uh, they are very happy that they produce some of those building blocks in a very simple manner. And that was when people said, okay, so the building blocks are easy to make. Um, and let's move on and figure out what else, but it turned out to be very difficult. 
What is also important to realize is that those building blocks have their function and uh, uh, actually uh, the ability to form only if you consider them in the environment of water, H2O, liquid water. And so that is very important because some of the feedstock molecules and even some of those uh, uh, simple components uh, exist in, or probably exist in interstellar space or in the atmospheres um, at low density. Um, uh, that chemistry is very different from the chemistry that occurs in water. So one of my personal misconceptions is to think of all these uh, building blocks and molecules as simply what you see here, as what we see there and what we see here, these structural components which connect nitrogen and carbon and hydrogens and so on. But really the um, molecule once put in a water solution should be considered more of something like this. You have to account for all the water molecules, at least the first shell surrounding the, the core molecule. Those water molecules are arranged in a very particular manner. They're not, as I naively thought before, simply a medium in which the uh, molecule floats. And maybe a medium which provides protons and electrons occasionally. They're much more than that. They're actually a structure. They're structured around those molecules in very specific ways. And people who do the calculations, which uh, in the past 10 years have been possible for this kind of uh, um, uh, dynamics of these molecules, have to account for as many as the water molecules as they could in the actual calculation in order to do a good job. Anyway, the bottom line is that uh, some of this was understood uh, about uh, 10 years ago when it came to the very simple um, basis for, which you see here, adenine and cytosine. That, just that part of the polymer, the base. And what people did at the time, because it was easier to start that way, is to look at the photostability of the bases. And um, lo and behold, it turned out that the four, five bases, because RNA has U instead of T, but the AGCT of DNA plus the U of RNA are extremely photostable. And that was kind of the first smoking gun which points in the direction in which I want to take you today. That there is a really strong uh, uh, evidence that UV light played a role in the synthesis and selection of those early blocks. And so to put the actual numbers, this was done in about uh, two or three labs around the world in the past 10 years, so 10 years ago, Bernd Kohler in Ohio State and uh, Domke and Zinth in uh, uh, Munich. They found that if you compare the um, canonical bases, or the actual bases that life uses, to their derivatives or isomers or totomers, there is a huge difference in uh, how long it takes for them to get the excited. The activation is essentially the way in which you think about photostability. Uh, in other words, um, the excited state lifetimes of U and T are half a picosecond, while in some of their molecules, derivatives, they're orders magnitude longer. Orders of magnitude long. And you know, um, as a non-chemist, when I look at those four molecules, they look very similar to me. You know, why should that be? And, you know, uh, it's quite striking. It's not just those four. There are many more. Um, of course, uh, that was interesting. It was good. Uh, at the time, people thought, well, and still think, um, having DNA made of bases which are photostable is really good, so you don't get as much skin cancer, you know. But also, from the point of view of how you get there, that makes a lot of uh, uh, sense. So people were going in that direction already 10 years ago. The point was, um, they really want to understand what was the reason behind it. And that now, in the last couple of years, has really helped push this 
in way beyond the initial uh, kind of indication that something interesting is going on. So let's, let's actually look at why this is so. Why molecules which are so similar uh, when you look at them structurally and they produce with the same chemical reactions, which is exactly the point I'm going to, actually uh, so different in terms of their photostability. So you have to understand what the excitation uh, process is and particularly the deactivation that happens. So there is your typical energy diagram for um, a Frank Condon state for a molecule. Um, you pump in the UV to the excited singlet state, S1, and then it just moves there until it fluoresces down. That will be fluorescence, you know, one way to radiatively deactivate. If you end up being too much pumped and go over the small barrier and go into a triplet state, then you will phosphoresce, same thing. These radiative deactivation processes take a long time. This is why these guys linger around for picoseconds, uh, well, nanoseconds, actually. Um, not picoseconds, nanoseconds, and so on. So the question is, is there a better way? And it turns out occasionally, not often, but occasionally there is a better way you get a shortcut, or you can cheat in quantum mechanics, and you can go through a conical intersection. That's the name for this thing. It's called a conical intersection, where your singlet state and your ground state are somehow degenerate, and you can quickly go through this. Well, how would this happen? Um, um, so UIC is ultra-fast internal conversion, and VC is vibrational cooling. So obviously, if you can do this, then you can transfer um, your um, energy to the solvent. Remember, it is not just the, this, but there are the water molecules around you. And the reason this is possible is because, as you can see here, these molecules have uh, degrees of freedom where they can actually um, uh, distort. And that particular case for adenine here, which is this one as well, is a distortion which involves this carbon atom and which is called ring puckering. So that ring puckering, which is possible in this configuration, leads you through a degenerate intersection here and very quickly vibrationally sends that energy, so to say, to the surrounding water molecules and very particular water molecules, I should say, the ones which are always there for you. So it happens extremely quickly. There is a kind of better a way to describe this. Uh, these diagrams that I showed you before are, um, um, are actually um, a little bit misleading because they're two-dimensional, but this is really a multi-dimensional parameter space because there are too many possible degrees of freedom. And so if you at least try to do it in three-dimensional, you can imagine that there are planes. And if there is an opportunity for this kind of deformation, some of these planes will intersect. That will be the conical intersection. And that will bring you uh, very quickly down to where you started. So the activation is very quick. And conical intersections um, are the way you do this for these small molecules. And of course, uh, because of that, because they involve very specific conformations here, uh, they are very sensitive to the structure. So what happens is if you have the example, say, of adenine, which I'm holding here, there, so this way for you, uh, and the conical intersection is particularly related to that carbon atom number, number two, which is this one here, and you do something to block the opportunity for that carbon atom number two to, uh, to torque or twist, then you are uh, you're completely blocked from a conical. There is no conical intersection. There is no intersection, so you're lingering there for nanoseconds. Now, this is uh, confirmed experimentally. It's not just theory. And that's the beauty of it. 
in fact, still difficult to do this theoretically only. Uh, but the more important thing is that since the last five, ten years, things have moved on. We now know that, unlike we thought uh, 30 years ago, that you can build those nucleotides from the opportunity to put together the sugar with the base and then the phosphate group and so on, which people tried for 50 years to do and never succeeded to this day. Now we know that there are ways also to shortcut the synthesis and to produce the entire nucleotide uh, before uh, you have actually put together the individual components separately. So in a certain sense, we have a problem because 10 years ago we understood why the basis is so photostable and we said, hey, that's great, but now we have a different pathway to produce RNA. And so that is kind of not good enough because remember, it's very sensitive molecular structure. The fact that this is photostable absolutely doesn't guarantee that this is going to be photostable at all from what you just learned. So there is need for more experiments and this is where uh, my new lab comes, uh, comes in because it um, turned out that nobody else is interested in doing those um, and part of it is it's not medically interesting at this point. So. Um, most of this kind of equipment is used by people who are interested in medical applications. So, the new experiments are now to do this on nucleosides and actually the whole thing and the particular reactions which are involved. And if that succeeds, that's a big project, we just started the new lab recently, then we will be able to say, okay, there is a connection between the pathways and the UV um, selectivity and they match. And so there is some stronger evidence now that the initial conditions on planet Earth determined why you have the RNA you have today or the other components for that matter. And so this is the moment in which I want to tell you about a particular project which was the first step in that direction and it was successfully completed and actually just last week was accepted for publication. Sam Roberts is a student with uh, Matt Pounder's lab at uh, University College London. And uh, it involves uh, the selective case of adenine, which is this molecule, and inosine, which is very similar to adenine. Instead of this uh, nitrogen, we have an oxygen here. Uh, and often the, the question is why adenine why is inosine not more involved in DNA and RNA? And the answer to this goes through the whole reason why I'm talking about nucleotides in the first place in a particular scenario uh, to begin with. And this is the moment at which you have to wake up because it's halfway through my talk. And I'm still going to offer those for those who don't want to wake up. But, okay, so the quiz is going to be on this particular slide, so pay attention. Okay, any takers? Well, okay, then you brace yourself. Okay, so uh, as uh, my uh, student Zoe Todd says, this is the one that she puts up to scare all the astronomers. Uh, okay, so. What you have here is, of course, um, a representation of only about 10% uh, uh, of the actual network. It's um, been simplified in order to fit on a single page. Uh, and even then, you can't see it. And it doesn't matter because uh, even I cannot really lead you through each one of those steps uh, confidently. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is to realize that this is a network which so far has been successfully shown in the lab and which leads you from very simple uh, initial feedstock molecules to uh, amino acids, 10 total lipid precursors, and some of the ribonucleotides, the pyrimidines, which are uh, the simpler ones, as opposed to the purines, which are the little bit more complicated ones. Adenine is a 
purine-based nucleotide. So the way this works is you really start with hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is at the core or at the beginning of uh, this chemistry. And uh, uh, that's why it's called a cyanosulfidic photoredox chemistry because it involves cyanide, it involves sulfur in many places, uh, and particularly in that very important production of the two and three carbon sugars, which I'll come back to. So hydrogen cyanide is involved in many places here, and UV light is involved in more than those three places. Actually, it's all over the place, but these are very important places which I will highlight for you. So that's why it's called photoredox chemistry. It's basically the uh, reduction of hydrogen cyanide to produce those products. This chemistry, once uh, you started it, it leads to those products without you having to send an army of uh, postdocs and graduate students to tinker with it. So that's the nice thing about it. There are parts of it which are not yet working, like the purine nucle ribonucleotides are not figured out yet. But the important thing is that it gives you a very good framework. And uh, let's start with paying attention to this particular uh, part of the network, which is surrounded by a blue line here. This is the network which starts with hydrogen cyanide, uh, goes through a production of these two sugars, very important step, the producing the two carbon and three carbon sugars. And then, uh, with the help of this particular two carbon sugar and uh, some unusual molecules, leads to the production of C and U, cytosine and uracil or the nucleotides which are re, uh, related to them. Um, all of the environment in which this happens uh, can be, uh, so far, is well matched to geochemical environments which correspond to the early Earth. But what to me was the most important thing about this, and which was not that much highlighted in the original paper from 2009, was not simply the fact that you start with those feedstock molecules and you end up with very large yield, very large yield, of these two very important ribonucleotides. The more important thing to me was that in one very particular part of the network, which I'm emphasizing here, there were these uh, uh, purple lines here, where it says some funny things which I can't even pronounce, or byproducts and products, and then they disappear. It's called destruction. So that is, let's look at this one. So what turns out to be happening here is while you're producing your C nucleotide, you're producing 16 other products. Remember those look-alike molecules that we call isomers, totomers? Uh, chemists have all kinds of names for them that I don't understand to this day, but they look the same, you know? The problem with chemical reactions, I learned, is that when they tell you, oh, this chemical reaction produces B from A, it produces 10 other B primes and B, B second primes. It's just they say it produces mostly B, but they don't tell you that it produces all kinds of other junk. This junk is important because this is what happened after Urey and Miller experiments were done in the 60s, 50s and 60s, people uh, came to understand the so-called tar or asphalt catastrophe. These beakers, as you left them to keep going, were getting browner and browner and stickier and stickier. They were full of products, byproducts. And yes, they had the right products for you. You could find adenine and you could find other things inside, uh, but they were all surrounded by tar or asphalt. So you couldn't really build an RNA from them unless, and, and unless you got 10 graduate students to actually pick them out for you and put them together. So to me, the most important thing in that particular synthesis was this part, the predominant photodestruction. In other words, you put H, uh, uh, UV light, which you needed in order to get to that point, and you need in order to produce equal amounts of C and U, which is the case here, 
They were using 254 nanometers because that's a cheap mercury lamp emission line. And after three days, they had the CNU, but more importantly, they had gotten rid of 16 other byproducts. 16. And so to me, this is the more, the, the part which I, got me excited about this. The UV light not only helps produce something, but also cleans up, and lo and behold, what is left, and C and U and nothing else. In astronomy, that will be considered uh, final proof for many of papers that I've written before. <laughs> so in chemistry, I guess it's still debatable. But to me, uh, that is why this happened after proposals and this and that. You should come and visit. We are always open now. Well, almost always. We're almost done um, uh, with um, uh, setting it up. Well, it will never be done because we always have new ideas. But basically, we're in production. We have uh, already the first paper based on experiments, and I'll show you some of that. So what is it? It's a tunable UV laser, but it's a lot more than that. It's really um, um, set up for ultra-fast transient spectroscopy, where ultra-fast means that you're working in femtoseconds and uh, picoseconds regimes. Uh, and um, it's transient because you're able to do spectroscopy as a function of time. So to do that, you need to have, first of all, of course, a laser, but you need to have a laser which produ produces pulses. And in this case, these are femtosecond uh, pulses. They have to be stable so that by the time you detect them in the spectrometer, you know which is which and what's going on. Uh, this kind of uh, lasers are well known. In fact, the reason I knew about them was because in HARPS, our radio velocity detection machine, we've been working, and the Philips finally has a very good calibration based on similar femtosecond lasers, but using a very different way but they are actually, uh, they are exactly the same, titanium sapphire based femtosecond lasers. They all work in the red, or infrared, 800 nanometers. So I want to pump my molecules in the UV because I want to reproduce the solar um, uh, region. And this is why Sukrit did what he did before we bought the laser. I didn't want to shell out all the money before I knew where I need to tune it. And the tuni tuning happens in this set of crystals, which are these two boxes, um, which are uh, a particular type of uh, nonlinear amplifiers, and they change the UV light, uh, the red light into UV. And there are two of them because we really wanted to go to 200 nanometers and maybe 190. We can actually pump at 190 nanometers and do so in a stable manner and not lose all the light in the process. So 95% of the energy here, which is 7 watts, comes through these uh, just to be lost mostly. And then some of it, 5% or less, is actually put into the spectrometer as a probe light. So the way this works when it comes to the spectrometer is that you get one uh, array, which is the probe, which is still 800, which goes through a delay line, and another one, which is the pump, and both of them converge to the sample, where the pump is pumping and the probe is probing. And then, of course, you're detecting. So how is the probe probing? The probe is probing because somewhere in the, well, I want to show you where, actually. Somewhere, which is right here, there is a set of crystals where these pulses, which are monochromatic, are dispersed into uh, uh, the spectrum, but still as a pulse. So let's say from 400 to 700 nanometers. You get the whole spectrum still as a pulse, uh, and it goes through the sample and gives you the actual spectrum. But it goes at very uh, particular intervals, which are determined by the delay line here. So you pump. And then you set a set of probes, which you can, because it's a femtosecond laser, which probe your sample, or in other words, give you the spectrum every 100 femtoseconds, let's say. So as a function of time, you get the absorbance, or the spectrum, in other words, as a function of time. And so if you excited something which decays, you will see it go up 
spectrally, you'll see the spectral lines, and then the spectral lines will decay with a certain uh, <coughs> lifetime. This is what I was showing you before that people did for the bases. They did this kind of experiments, and they said, lo and behold, these bases are photostable because they decay very quickly, half a picosecond as opposed to nanoseconds. So the system, which you see there, can go anywhere from uh, 100 femtoseconds all the way to millisecond. You know, that's, we have the ability to actually probe for a very long period of time. And so that is called ultra-fast transient spectroscopy and allows you to do a lot of good things, not just spectro uh, spectroscopy, but time resolved spectroscopy. You see dynamics, you can actually see what's going on. You can see the individual electrons if they're produced in the process, where they go, what they do, and so on. It's really beautiful uh, technique which is relatively new. Uh, not many people use it. So the way it works when you do the experiments, and I'm going to show you experiments that I did myself because I understand what I messed up in most of the time. But the way it works is, again, you have a spectrum, which is uh, measured in delta A, which is uh, um, it's not so important, but it is a spectrum. So 318 nanometers to 540 nanometers, so it's just a spectrum. Spectral lines uh, at those time scales and for those molecules are broad. So uh, there are essentially three spectral lines in this spectrum, in this spectral range. There is uh, two which overlap here and one that is here. So one here and two here. So that's simply the spectrum at 39, let's say 40 picoseconds. What you see here, which is a more interesting graph, is the same wavelength in this uh, graph in time in uh, the y-axis. So in y-axis, it's time. So wavelength and time. And uh, the color gives you basically the features. So you see them as uh, red, you know. You have the spectral line here in red and so on uh, going up. And so first of all, look at the time here. It's from uh, minus 800 femtoseconds, because I put the zero point here, to about 50 picoseconds in this particular case. And you uh, just remember, femtosecond is 10 to minus 15 seconds. So this is a lot of uh, uh, fast action here. So what you see here is the three spectral line. In fact, you see a third one, a fourth one, which is this uh, spectral line that is here that shows up and disappears. That's actually the reaction of the water solvent itself, the water. It's a Raman line that comes up and goes away in um, hundreds of femtoseconds. And so you take that away. Oh, another thing. There is a quiz for you. Why is this curve that way? So that's wavelength versus time. Physics 101. It's this person. You actually can see the delay. Anyway, so... There, we straighten it out now. So it's now time irrespective of the fact that there is a wavelength dependent delay. And I tried to remove the Raman thing, but didn't do a very good job. That's why I'm showing you stuff I did myself. So this is a particular um, a nucleotide, uh, inosine, but with a sulfur atom related to it. And I'll tell you why sulfur atom. And you could see, identify the individual lines with individual uh, um, particular uh, states of the molecule thanks to a very talented uh, theorist, um, Rafael Sabo, who do does these cal calculations, and we, we work together on this. So that's what it would normally work, look like. You can make it look more like actual spectra if you like that better, and sometimes I do, and some, that's easier to publish, actually, because color schemes can sometimes... Uh, be misleading, and certainly that's better to, to measure stuff. So then, of course, you take cross-sections here and say, well, what, how, does this, how do these three lines, spectral lines, behave in time? And so if you take one which is out here with the faster reaction, that's at 345, look, it goes up and very quickly decays. You know? So that's the time dependence I was talking about. So in this case, it's three picoseconds lifetime for that particular uh, spectral lines that corresponds to a very particular state or excited state in the molecule. Remember those uh, uh, 
surfaces from which we are looking for conical intersections. If there is one or if there isn't one, then you will be staying there forever. There must be a conical intersection here because this really went away very quickly. Three picoseconds <laughs> is really short. If there isn't one, then it looks like this. Now you have the puckered state in which it, did, it actually went up and slowly goes away. And again, we can go not for 60 picoseconds, as what you see here, but we can go for microseconds and even a millisecond if it takes that long to do this. And in this particular case, it was the com uh, comparison between inosine and adenine, and we now understand why if UV was the driver for the um, um, synthesis of those very similar nucleotides, adenine was selected uh, rather than inosine, because adenine is uh, pho much more photostable than inosine, and inosine actually goes away. Photostability, in terms of what I'm talking to you, is a very important thing to realize. So when I say, well, one of them decays in half a picosecond, the other one takes forever, meaning nanoseconds. It is a big difference, uh, because what is happening, remember, these molecules are not there in isolation. They're surrounded by water, and they are all surrounded by other molecules. So if you are excited, or even worse, if you're missing uh, electron or proton here and there, and you're sitting in that, waiting to radiatively de de uh, decay, then you are opening yourself to interactions with water or interactions with other molecules. And so from a chemical point of view, that molecule, if it's lingering in this excited state for more than uh, 100 nanoseconds, it's gone. It's dead. It's going to be something else by the time it actually gets rid of that energy. So that is what photostability means. Is if you decay very quickly, it makes a big difference. And I know this is a little bit abstract. It was for me, because femtoseconds, picoseconds, nanoseconds all sound the same. But it's a big difference, and uh, I, I will use an astronomical metaphor to show you that uh, this uh, lab equipment that we have in the lab is like a universe in a box, because from the point of view of time scale range, 10 to the 10 units of time, it's the same as compar comparing a typical seasonal time scale of one year to the entire age of the universe, or almost the entire, 10 to the 10. So there is a big difference between, you know, 200 femtoseconds and 800 microseconds. It's a whole lifetime for this molecule. And so that, 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 make, that is what makes the difference here. So ultrafast uh, spectroscopy, what I was just describing to you, is indeed very useful for many things. What I am using it right now is simulating stellar UV light and finding the production of those reducing agents like solvated electrons and radicals or photonization effects that actually are part of that big network. And as I told you before, it is really the context is important and we can uh, do it. Simulating the stellar UV light means not working just with a, a mercury lamp in one single emission line, but working with the actual spectrum. And uh, the approach seems to work so far. That is, whenever you apply in your experiments uh, the knowledge from astrophysics or geophysics of what should the environment and the agents really look like, uh, the result is improvement in what, what you get, improvement in uh, what the chemists got when they were using a single emission line. So to me, that's another smoking gun that this is uh, somehow relating to the selectivity or the particular building blocks and that UV light was involved early on. So this is uh, Zoe Todd, uh, a very talented astronomy st graduate student who is doing chemistry very successfully. So that's um, a particular uh, paper that uh, was a co co very nice cooperation with the Jack Shostak group at uh, MGH where we looked particularly at the production of the two sugars, the two carbon and three carbon sugars under UV light. And this had been shown with the mercury lamp, and Zoe did it with the actual wavelength dependence, determined uh, the quantum yield curve, 
And guess what? It works much better. And under a situation which is much more relating to the geophysical conditions. Now, this was done a year ago with uh, uh, copper cyanide. The relevant uh, cyanides are the ferrocyanides, which Zoe is doing right now as we speak. And there, the cycle is somewhat more complicated, and we know that this is the way in order to understand it and to move the whole thing further. So more, again, to the point of selectivity, which was I was trying to make, that is, especially in this case with these two and three carbon sugars, if you use any of the other reactions, this is what you get. You do get the two carbon sugars and the three carbon sugar, but you get everything else as well. And so that's, that's where I think we are going to understand better how to move forward in this project. And of course, the big next step, the final step, is to go to the level of the protocell. For that, you have to do the polymerization. And so that's where we are going next. Um, uh, that's what we haven't done, but that's where we are going next. In collaboration with other colleagues, Jack is certainly the central person in that. And it's not just polymerization, but how do you incorporate this in vesicles, as he does here. And there is a particular approach which he is now favoring with this very unusual little molecule, which is what we are trying to do. But the moment you start polymerizing those uh, individual uh, molecules into bigger molecules themselves, into the RNA itself, you run into other uh, photochemical uh, phenomena, because now they become bigger and different, which for the first time get you to uh, the reasons for actually skin cancer, when you end up with uh, excited states that are long-lived, because now you have really stacked the bases and the nucleotides, and there is the opportunity for charge transfers between them. They're close enough in water environment to do that, and these charge transfers then lingers too long before it converts down. And uh, all we know is thanks to the work by Dominique Boucher and Corinna Kufner, who are both of them are here with us now, uh, is that as soon as you base pair them, some of these problems are alleviated. So we are trying to understand this in the bigger picture of uh, the origins of life. So this is just the beginning of a very exciting project. I hope I try to uh, at least explain to you why I'm so excited about the chemistry, even though I don't understand it. Because to me, there are so many things which come together in a beautiful way in which you build a puzzle and suddenly you can see uh, the bigger picture out of the individual pieces of that puzzle. And uh, what I'm saying is through understanding what leads to this, we see a really clear evidence how the star and the planet influence the selection of these components. So basically from the very beginning, but especially now with the taste of some initial successes here, our approach is to integrate those two, to integrate the lab experiments with the geochemical and physical observations. And we really mean it. In many cases, uh, this is just something you write in the introduction of your proposals, you know. But in this case, we really follow as close as possible what we see. And the big problem when it comes to prebiotic chemistry for early Earth is we don't have that much evidence. Uh, you know that old rocks are not available on the surface of the Earth because the Earth is active. Plate tectonics has eliminated essentially all rocks that are older than 4 billion years. And uh, only small inclusions like zircons date further back. But we don't have that evidence, certainly not in terms of sedimentary rocks which are well preserved. But there is a planet which is very similar originally to early Earth, which has all that record sitting for us to read, and that's Mars. So the proposal that we've put together in this new paper is that we should really try to get as much from those conditions and put them in the lab as we can. Look at the surface age for Mars versus surface age for the Earth as a function of time. Almost nothing is preserved for uh, Earth. For Mars, a lot more is preserved, and it's very relevant. The second one is we need 
the exoplanet spectroscopy because uh, uh, this whole story about the CO2 atmospheres is a hypothesis based on modeling and some experiments, but mostly modeling. So I really hope that in the next few years we will start confirming or disproving this suggestion or pro proposal here that rocky planets end up with carbon dioxide atmospheres. If that's not the case, then uh, the Earth is a special case in which the UV light was just right for this kind of building blocks and life that we see here. And I couldn't have even started doing this without thanking all these people. So thank you for listening. So, uh, Professor Saslaw, let me begin by saying how impressed I am that you used the Big Bang and planet formation as the easy, intuitive concept <laughs> to explain <laughs> orders of magnitude. That was, I think, something you could do only to this audience. So. <laughs> um, okay, this is, this is a fascinating uh, catch-up on what you've been up to. Uh, so, uh, questions for uh, Dimitar. In term, simple organic reactions that proceed with ultraviolet light proceed not because of the energetics, because of the conservation of the orbital symmetry. Is that what's happening when your long-lived states disappear? Um, so the, the role of the UV light is on one hand exactly what you said, but also very importantly in producing solvated electrons. So in many of those steps, the solvated electrons are crucial in order for the chemical reaction to go in the direction in which you want it to go as a reducing agent. So that is the role of uh, actually um, uh, sulfur, and sulfur dioxide in particular, we believe, uh, with its um, um, bisulfate uh, when it's mixed with water, is one of those uh, uh, ways to produce solvated electrons. So on one hand, um, uh, solvated electrons is very important to us. On the other hand, in several occasions, uh, several parts of the network, direct interaction with the UV light, as you said, is important. Not only in terms of selectivity, where you preserve some products and destroy others, but we also believe in some very particular cases in which uh, you have photo, photo anomerization. That is, the chemistry produces the wrong uh, uh, um, the wrong uh, uh, chiral or stereoisomer, and the UV light very easily flips it to the right one. Uh, we've seen two cases of that already in this network. So I would say you're right, but only uh, that's only one third of the role of the UV light. Dimitar, in terms of the initial conditions that you're trying to mimic, in particular the, the UV spectrum, uh, do you worry at all or consider the effects of particulate matter in the atmosphere, which can yes. absorb UV yes. light, and whether there would be on a larger scale a relation between volcanism, which puts these particular... Right, so a lot of what uh, Sukrit Ranjan did in his uh, thesis was actually worrying about all those uh, effects and uh, separately for the Earth and separately for Mars. And particularly with Mars, we are concerned about particulates. And the whole paper is, half of the paper is about that. So it turned out that in the end of the day, uh, CO2 was the most important and sulfur dioxide was the next most important. So that's why I kind of summarized the labor of five years as a graduate student of Sukrit in just one sentence. But the, it turns out that it's not so important for that mid-range UV. It's very important for further out, but not for the mid-range. Uh, Eric? Uh, very intriguing, Nibitar. So you alluded to this towards the end of your talk with the susceptibility of the stack basis to mm -hmm. excitation by UV. So I'm wondering, is there a way with which we can discriminate between the possibilities that the selection, the UV selection, took place at the prebiotic stage versus the biotic stage. That is, you could have a lot of critters running around. Yes, so that is exactly what I'm saying. Acids. So thank you for 
saying it because I forgot to say it, but uh, basically, uh, to some extent, it's obvious. You cannot have Darwinian evolution before you, before you have genetic molecules. So basically, building the genetic <coughs> molecule has to happen in chemical selectivity. And once you've had it and it's working, you can start Darwinian evolution. So basically what I'm saying is um, the initial molecular sur survival was uh, driven by UV chemical selectivity and the consequent biological function must have continued to be now in a different way, not through conical intersections, uh, be the result of that uh, until you have protocells that can function and start having progeny and then uh, exploring the new uh, kind of landscape of more complex structures and what we really call the Rinian evolution. But how do you distinguish those two given that the We'll have to understand have this in order to, to tell you even a beginning of an answer. Okay. So Corina Kufner, who is the graduate student there, she is the expert on this. So talk to her. <laughs> You reached my level of uh, incompetence. <laughs> I, I can't go all, further beyond that. that level. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have kind of naive question about the uh, RNA-based stuff. This thing you are starting, you starting your talk from. So you are trying to reproduce RNAs. That's is it, right? In the lab. Yes. So uh, there is this RNA form of life on Earth, which is called viruses. Mm -hmm. And not all biologists consider them as a form of life. Mm -hmm. I talk to biologists, some of them say, okay, we don't know if this is a life or not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you consider viruses like a form of life? And the second question, aren't you afraid that you'll produce some harmful stuff in your lab? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the answer to the first question is, I don't consider viruses a um, uh, separate living entity. I consider viruses as being byproduct of an existing single cell or multicellular ecosystem. And this is based not on my personal understanding, but on uh, me talking to other colleagues and going to conferences. So that's just uh, so you know, it's not my field of knowledge. Um, uh, but this said, um, uh, they are interesting from the point of view of the functionality of RNA, sure. I mean, uh, that's one of the reasons why people say we don't need DNA except from st a stability point of view. So DNA is more stable long-term, and that's why it's so successful. Uh, but RNA by itself can do all the things that DNA can do. And so viruses, which uh, don't care that much about uh, individual survival, because there are many of them, uh, they can function perfectly well just with RNA. The second question about producing something harmful, I'm talking here about chemistry. And actually, the result of that chemistry is less harmful than the uh, input, uh, the input yeah. chemicals. <laughs> you know, the hydrogen sulfide yeah. and the cyanides are a lot more dangerous than what they become once we do that. So, but uh, just to be clear, even uh, when this project is successful and there is a really uh, self-replicating, non-enzymatically self-replicating RNA-based cell, it will be so fragile and so impossible for it to really uh, produce a, a colony uh, that people are much less concerned about that than any kind of genetic engineering, which is a lot closer to home. So in other words, the, the things that really kill you are the things that your body or anybody cannot recognize very much from what already exists. This is uh, about 10 to the 10 orders of magnitude away from that. <laughs> Still very interesting, but not anywhere close to what can harm you compared to hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> yes, Ramesh. So this, uh, this fast de-excitation, and it's not radiative, you said, because radiative, yeah, it's not radiative yeah. would be much too slow. Somehow that excited wave function is ending up as the yeah, it's wave a function. Genre. It's a generous. Yeah. yeah, but what is the quantum mechanics of that? What is the interaction term that allows it to do that so quickly? 
Yeah, so I'll be happy to show you even some videos, uh, especially this fellow Rafal uh, has beautiful videos of how this works. With They use the wave functions to this, do these calculations, very small calculations. But So the quantum mechanics of this is not that complicated if you think about how close some of these uh, excited states are right, in terms of all the possible coordinates. So all you need to do is to put enough energy into um, the uh, um, out of the ordinary vibrations to actually occasionally have the two intersect or be very close to each other. And in the videos, you actually see exactly that. There are fluctuations which occasionally bring them so close together that the, uh, uh, the excited state which is lingering there suddenly uh, goes right down. Uh, it could happen in femtoseconds, but instead it happens in picoseconds. Remember, as Feynman said, there is a lot of space uh, at the bottom. There is a lot of time at the bottom, too. So that's why I was showing this comparison with the universe. There is a lot of time. If you have picoseconds, there is a lot of time. But still, the diffusion time with the rest of the uh, solution is even longer. So this is considered really fast the activation as opposed to if you never have access to it, which puts you orders of magnitude longer, and then you're dead. So, so, on one hand, there is no exotic quantum mechanics there. It's just what you know. On the other hand, uh, it was not known because you had, they're very rare, those. There are very few molecules which actually have the ability to, to enable that. And they have to be very flexible in a very particular way. Adenine is only flexible with carbon-2, the second carbon, but not with the other ones. <coughs> See, a couple of times in the talk and also now, you mentioned vibration. Mm -hmm. I think of vibration frequencies as much too low. It's not going to be picoseconds, right? What vibration are we talking about? The electrons or the molecule? Uh, of the electron clouds, so that's okay. Like, yeah. okay. So all these are electronic. The bonds. All these are electronic. Yeah. All these are electronic. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I want to show you the videos, because then you see the electronic clouds there and how they shift and change. Yes. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, make that clear, but obviously we're talking about five to seconds, so it should be. Yeah. So it should be very fast. We probably need to end soon, but may I ask a final kind of big picture question? Um, so, so this idea that the UV environment plays an important or even dominant role in terms of selecting which molecules would be present and dominate, and therefore allow later to form life, is that is that a is that a commonly accepted idea no. in, the, in the origins of life community? Or is it th th you're saying this is a con no, no. controversial or not yet accepted idea? Well, first of all, there is not enough work that I see. is done in that. Second, there is a lot of people who uh, still follow the um, uh, other uh, approach, which is uh, the one metabolism first or metabolic systems. Okay. Uh, those uh, uh, explicitly require uh, uh, shielded environments from any UV light, uh, at least in the way in which they are developed so far. Uh, when I decided to go in the building blocks, surficial UV uh, direction, uh, under the influence of people like Jack Shostak, of course, and then John Sutherland, was because I saw a real uh, uh, opportunity to actually do experiments or theoretical work in trying to understand whether this works or not. Uh, the other approach is so far behind now uh -huh. in its experimental or its theoretical work that I, I didn't see any role I could do much there except to talk about uh, the availability of these environments on planets, which is obvious if you have uh, oceans somewhere deep in the ocean, you will have that kind of environment. So um, uh, I would say um, we encounter very much this resistance in trying to publish papers. So is laughing there because we occasionally, in fact, almost invariably, get a referee who would say, but it is well established uh, that UV light is harmful to synthesis and origin of life. And uh, they would have even no reference attached, although you can put the references. Um, so, in terms of the community, uh, the community is very divided, and a lot of the work that I refer to here 
is literally only been done in the last three, four years, as Karen uh, and I know painfully well. And um, I think the only way in which we are going to move forward is to do more of the work and to show to more people that this is actually working. And I was asked to give this colloquium, I think, a year ago. And I decided not to because now these papers were yet published. And so I thought, well, uh, I don't want to talk about something which we are not even sure ourselves. So, so this is a relatively new avenue, I would say. And um, I think you'll hear much more about it because things are moving very fast. So. Thank you. Well, let's uh, thank Democrat. <laughs>